Uh, welcome everyone. My name is Alice Tipping and I lead work on trade policy at the International Institute for Sustainable Development. Uh, thank you very much to all of you who are joining us here in room D at the World Trade Organization in Geneva. Uh, and thank you to the many of you joining us online uh, on Zoom. Um, for those of you joining us online, the usual uh, etiquette requests apply. Please keep, your, keep yourselves muted, um, but we will keep the, is it the chat box or the Q&A box? chat or Q&A? Both? So both the chat and the Q&A boxes are open if you'd like to ask questions as we go along. Um, I have a colleague who will be monitoring both of them and can feed the questions to me in the discussion. So um, today we're launching IISD's self-assessment toolkit for the implementation of the WTO Fisheries Subsidies Agreement. Uh, this event is essentially members only. That's WTO members only. Uh, so you all know about the agreement you reached in June. I'm not going to repeat what's in it, but I do want to repeat my congratulations to all of you for that achievement. I think it's important that we remember we can't take international cooperation for granted. Uh, and this agreement is a remarkable form of that cooperation. So well done to all of you. It is of course, just a first step though. It's a first step in several ways. But that's a first step because there were, of course, a number of rules focused on subsidies to overcapacity and overfishing over which convergence wasn't possible. Uh, and these are the topic of your ongoing negotiations and the subject, no doubt, of many more IISD seminars. Um, because we will, in fact, continue to offer all WTO members on an equal footing the same impartial, evidence based, and balanced input and analysis that our team have been providing to these negotiations uh, for the past eight years. So the agreement is also a first step in the sense that its impact on subsidies and on fisheries will depend on how it is implemented. And so to support all of you and all of your authorities in the implementation of this agreement, we've put together what we, help, what we hope is a useful toolkit. It's relatively simple. It's an Excel spreadsheet. Um, and it will help you, we think, to think through whether your policy and your practice aligns with the obligations under the new treaty. And it helps you to identify what you might need to do to ensure that your practice and policy stays aligned with those obligations. So as a tool, it's, it's, it's sort of a bit of a Swiss army knife in the sense that it can serve a number of different functions. So in addition to helping you assess the alignment of your policies with the obligations, you can actually use the tool in the form of the Excel workbook to capture and to share information across your departments and to identify what technical assistance might be useful for your implementation. So in that sense, uh, while this is the product of a completely independent, unofficial, non-governmental think tank, we hope that it is a useful tool to facilitate your official discussions about technical assistance and about implementation. At this point, I want to pause uh, and express our sincere thanks to the funders who have made all of this work and this toolkit possible, and that's the government of Germany, the government of Sweden, and the Pew Charitable Trusts. So our thanks go to all of them for their perseverance, uh, because the work on this toolkit uh, began long before the agreement was finalized and continued throughout the various delays in the agreement being finalized. So, so a sincere thanks to those governments uh, and to that foundation for their patience and allowing this toolkit to follow the progress of the negotiations. I'm not going to steal any more of my colleagues' thunder. Um, I'm, I'm going to introduce the, the panel and it's going to start first with my colleagues, Tristan Hirschinger and Yeva Barschauskaite. Uh, the tool represents many, many months of their time and their work. So congratulations to both of them uh, on its publication. They're going to present the tool. Uh, Tristan will take us through what it does. Um, and Yeva will give you a live demonstration of exactly what it looks like on the website. Uh, so that you know where to find it and what it looks like when you get to the web page. Um, and after their presentations, we're going to have four discussants. Uh, they're going to provide us with a range of perspectives on the implementation process in front of all of us. We're going to begin with two of the key agencies who are likely to have quite important roles in supporting the implementation of this agreement, the World Bank and the FAO. 
The World Bank is represented on my extreme left by Julien Million, who is a senior fisheries specialist with the Pro Blue team. Uh, and Julien has flown from Washington to be here in person today, uh, which in the post-pandemic area is an extra sign of commitment. Um, so thank you, Julien, for, for the time involved in being here. Um, and the FAO is represented by Dominique Bourgeon. Many of you will know him well. Uh, he is, of course, uh, the director of the FAO's liaison office here in Geneva. So Dominique, thank you for coming as well. We're there going, then going to hear from two WTO members, colleagues of yours, uh, about what they think of the tool, uh, but also more generally how they're thinking about the implementation process and support for it. Uh, online, we have Mr. Parmanan Dabi, who is Acting Scientific Officer at the Ministry of Blue Economy, Marine Resources, Fisheries and Shipping of the Republic of Mauritius. Uh, so thank you very much, Mr. Dabi, for joining us by video. Um, and then last but absolutely not least, I'm pleased to hand the floor to Frank Ritter, who is Councillor at the Permanent Mission of Germany uh, to the WTO. Um, so. That essentially is our agenda. I realize that many of you uh, will probably have to get to meetings that start punctually again at three o'clock. Uh, so we will aim to finish maybe five minutes before three, just to give you some time to get to your next engagements. So that's it. Um, I'll hand the first the floor first to you, perhaps, Tristan. Go ahead. Thanks a lot, uh, Alice, and hi, everyone. Um, it's great to be to be here to be to be able to present that tool that we've worked so much on. Uh, so so that self-assessment tool to to support implementation of the WTO Fisheries Subsidies Agreement. Uh, so in the, in the next twenty minutes or so, I'll try to give you a good overview of what the tool is and what WTO members can use it for, uh, and then I'll pass the floor to uh, to Yeva for a more interactive uh, live demonstration of uh, of what it actually looks like in real life. Uh, and of course, we are happy to to answer any particular questions you may have in the in the Q and A segment. So, I thought I would start with uh, with a couple of preliminary remarks uh, about the tool. Um, as mentioned, the tool has been designed um, to support WTO members' efforts to prepare for the implementation of this uh, of this new treaty, uh, and more generally to guide their implementation efforts. Um, it's been published on our website, so it's now live. It's been published last week. Um, and so it's uh, it's available to all WTO members um, to, to use. Government officials can download the tool, uh, and then they can use it internally, so within their respective administrations in a, in a confidential way. What this means is that uh, using the tool, um, each, each member using the tool will do the self-assessment exercise for itself. Um, and it will decide also for itself what to do with the results of the, of the self-assessment tool. Um, some members may choose to keep all this information for themselves. Others may choose to share parts of the, of the results of the self-assessment, for example, with uh, development partners. But that's really, uh, that's really their choice and up to them. It's also important to emphasize here that, uh, that the tool is not uh, an official legal interpretation of the treaty. So it's only IISD's humble attempt to provide some guidance on what we think the new rules mean mm -hmm. and what we think they require in terms of implementation, but it should not be taken as, uh, as official legal advice. Mm -hmm. So let's now look at the, at the tool itself. Um, so the tool includes two separate documents. The, the first document and the core document of the tool is what we call the checklist. So it's essentially a series of tables to be filled by, uh, by providing information and by answering questions. Um, and that's really the center of the, of the self-assessment exercise. That's the document on which users will, uh, will actually work as they do this, uh, this self-assessment. The, um, the second document is what we call the guide. Uh, and it's meant to be a supporting document that provides some explanations about how to fill out the checklist. So for each table of the checklist and for each column or each question that you will find in these tables, there is a corresponding part in the guide uh, with detailed explanations. Um, and the guide also includes more background and some general explanations about the, about the various obligations in the agreement. 
the tool has been developed to um, to help WTO members to do several things. Um, first, it will help members to collect and to record key information and data that's needed for implementation. Um, this is done through what we call inventory tables, and we'll come back to that in uh, in some of the next slides. Second, the tool will allow members to assess their current alignment with the new rules and to identify any immediate corrective action that would be uh, that would be needed, if any. Uh, so here, this is really about the current policy situation uh, with regard to the to the new rules. For example, to determine if any of the subsidies that are prohibited that are provided today are actually prohibited under the disciplines. Third, the tool helps members to assess whether the mechanisms needed for ongoing alignment with the new rules are in place domestically. Uh, and this aspect here is more about the long term than the previous one. Uh, we'll come back to that distinction in the in the next slides. Um, and finally, the tool will also help members to identify and to articulate where they would need technical assistance and capacity building for implementation. Uh, and we hope that this will be a particularly useful aspect of the tool, uh, especially for developing country members. Um, so that provides you uh, with a short overview of what the tool is and what it allows members to do. Uh, and in the next slides, we'll go into just a little bit more detail uh, about these various elements. Um, so this table, um, as mentioned, yeah, sorry, I'm, I was lost in my notes. Mm -hmm. So as mentioned, the, the, the first thing that, uh, that the tool allows to do is really to collect key information and data that's needed for implementation. And the way this is structured in the in the checklist and in the tool is a series of what we call inventory tables. So those tables really guide that uh, that information collection process. And there are four of uh, of such inventory tables. The, the first table is about domestic fisheries subsidies. So it allows to list and to provide information on all the subsidies provided by domestic authorities um, that fall within the scope of the agreement. The second table uh, allows to collect information on subsidized fisheries, meaning the, the fleets that are subsidized, but also the stocks they fish. Uh, and it also comes with, uh, with an add-on table to, to record available catch data. Um, the third table allows to record information on the status of, uh, of fish stocks and on relevant management measures. Uh, and as you will have guessed, this is particularly relevant for implementation of Article 4 on overfished stocks. Uh, and finally, the fourth, the fourth table allows to collect information on, uh, on vessels and operators identified as having engaged in illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing. So, so very relevant for, for, the, for the implementation of, uh, of Article 3 uh, and, the, and the IUU fishing subsidy prohibition. Um, the information that will be collected in those tables can then be very useful to answer many of the questions in the in the checklist. But one thing I wanted to emphasize here is that um, it's not only a one off exercise where you need to uh, to fill those tables, uh, do the assets, do the assessment, and that's it, right? Um, those tables, they can also be maintained up to date, uh, and that can allow the WTO members to actually re regularly collect uh, and to record this key information that's, uh, that's needed for ongoing uh, implementation. Um, so it's also useful more in the, in the long term. To provide you with a concrete example of what those inventory tables look like, um, this slide here shows you um, the, the first inventory table, which allows to record information on subsidies. Uh, I won't go into, um, into all the details on this table, but uh, it should provide you with a good sense of the, of the type of information that it allows to, to collect you'll see that uh, it asks for information such as the program name, the authority responsible for a subsidy, um, the type or form of subsidy, uh, a short description of, uh, of every scheme, and, uh, and also information on the amount. Um, there are also two columns, those on the right, uh, which ask whether each subsidy fulfills particular criteria. 
And this information will be useful to determine whether some of the rules apply to the to the various subsidies that are that are listed in that table. Um, one important remark um, here is that the tool can also be adjusted uh, by users if they feel that this would be more useful. So for example, if they feel that other pieces of information that are not included in those tables um, should be covered, uh, they can very well adjust the tool, add columns uh, if they feel that's, uh, that's useful. So it's not cast in stone, but it can be adapted to the needs of the, of the users. Um, so that's really the, the just an example. That's the first inventory table. As I mentioned, there are others, but that was to to provide you with a, with an example. Mm -hmm. So um, so this was really about the the initial phase of information collection that the tool allows to do. And once this has been done, um, users can move to what is really the core part of the, of the tool, which is focused on the various legal obligations that are included in the agreement. And here, what the tool does is that for each legal obligation, um, it addresses them in two distinct steps, right? Uh, which means through two distinct tables. And this is what uh, I will show you on, on this particular slide. So for each, uh, for each obligation, the first step is what we call the current alignment table. And what this table allows to do is to, is to assess a member's current level of alignment with, uh, with the obligation and to identify any immediate action that would be required to align with this obligation. So it's really about today. Uh, it's a snapshot of the immediate policy alignment situation at the very moment the self-assessment is made. So to give you a more concrete sense, these tables, uh, they would typically ask questions to determine whether any prohibited subsidies are, are provided today. Uh, and we'll see actually a, a concrete example on the, on the next slide. Um, the second step for each legal, uh, legal obligation uh, is what we call the ongoing alignment table. Um, and what this table allows to do is to assess whether the mechanisms that are needed to enable ongoing alignment with an obligation are in place domestically, to identify any possible gaps in terms of those mechanisms, and when these mechanisms are not in place, to identify and to articulate any possible needs for technical assistance and capacity building. So here, the question is not about current alignment, but rather about the existence of domestic mechanisms or the existence of a system um, to enable members to be and to remain aligned with the obligation in an ongoing way. Um, so to put it simply, the type of question asked for current alignment uh, is more something like, do I provide any prohibited subsidy today? Whereas the type of question asked for ongoing alignment is more something like, do my laws, regulations, and procedures operate in a way that prevents the provision of prohibited subsidies in an ongoing way? Um, I wanted to give you a concrete sense of what these uh, these tables look like. So, uh, so that is an example of a typical current alignment table, um, which in this case is for the IUU fishing subsidy prohibition. So the question used here that you see in the in the little uh, red box uh, has been simplified just to give you a clear sense of the type of questions that are asked in these tables. But in the actual checklist, it's uh, it's disaggregated in several questions. So here the question is, does the member provide subsidies to vessels or operators identified as engaged in IUU fishing? And we see we see why it's about current alignment, right, because it's really about whether today any prohibited subsidy are provided to, uh, to IUU actors. Um, you'll see that before allowing to respond to the question and to record any relevant information, the table also gives guidance on the, on the type of information that would be useful to answer the question. Uh, and this column will very often refer to those inventory tables that I mentioned earlier. So this shows how such inventory tables will be useful to, uh, to do that self-assessment exercise. 
Um, and finally, you'll see that the last column gives information on whether any further action is needed to align with the obligation. Uh, and that will depend on the on the answer that's provided for each question. So, so typically, uh, this column will say something like, if you answer no, then no further action is needed. Uh, and if you answer yes, the, the subsidy must be removed or, or something along those lines in a, in a slightly more detailed way, but that's the, that's the ID. The, the second example here is about that second step that the tool allows to, to do for each obligation. Uh, so it shows you an example of those ongoing alignment tables. Um, and so that should give you a good idea of what these tables uh, look like as well. So first you'll see that the type of questions uh, that are asked in, uh, in these tables uh, is very different. Uh, in the current alignment table, it was about whether any prohibited subsidy was provided at a given moment. Um, and here we see that the questions are more about the mechanisms. So the laws, the regulations, the procedures that need to be in place so that no prohibited subsidies are provided both now and in the future. So really in an ongoing way. Um, so the second question here, for example, is do the domestic laws, regulations, and procedures uh, that govern the provision of subsidies operate so that no subsidy can be provided to vessels or operators that are subject to an IUU determination? Uh, and we see that it's really about those uh, those domestic mechanisms that need to be to be in place. Uh, here again, the the table asks for a simple yes no uh, answer, if possible. It then allows to, to describe the current domestic situation regarding those ongoing alignment mechanisms. Um, it also allows to identify the actions that must be taken to establish such uh, mechanisms in case they are not in place. Um, and finally, you'll see that the last column on the right is about technical assistance and capacity building needs. So the idea here is really that for each obligation, users can use this column to identify and to articulate needs for assistance uh, in a structured and quite detailed way. Uh, and once they have done so, it may help their governments to, to make requests for, for assistance that are targeted. Uh, and so it may help them make such requests in a, in a more compelling way. So, uh, so we hope this will be particularly useful to developing country members. Um, here, I just wanted to, to also highlight that the tool looks at all obligations in the agreement. So that includes subsidy rules and subsidy prohibitions, as we've seen in previous examples. But it also includes notifications and transparency obligations. Um, and for those transparency obligations, the approach is actually exactly the same as for the other obligations. So first, there is a current alignment table to assess whether the member has notified what it needs to notify at the very moment the, um, the self-assessment is made. And second, there is an ongoing alignment table to assess whether mechanisms are in place to regularly collect and to notify regularly the, the required information. So uh, in other words, to fulfill notification obligations in an ongoing way. Um, and here again, the tool allows to, to identify possible needs for assistance uh, in implementing those notification obligations. Um, a last point on this slide is that uh, regarding notification and transparency, there is also an additional table. Uh, and what it does is that it summarizes all notification and transparency obligations in the agreement, uh, including by providing information on the relevant timing for each of these obligations. So, so it can be a useful, uh, a useful tool to keep, uh, to keep track of these obligations. Um, we are having a small technical glitch. But... Now it looks better. Um, someone's doing. Yeah. I'm not able to change the slides anymore. But I just had one last slide to um, to really give a, uh, to to give you a few points about the guide because we've talked mostly about um, about the checklist. Um, and uh, this is to emphasize that the guide is uh, is very much a supporting document. So it's to be used if and when useful. Uh, it means that we don't expect anyone to read that document from the first page to the last one, but rather to go through the checklist. And whenever there is a need for further guidance or for further explanation, to refer to the to the corresponding part in the in the guide. So, so the guide starts by giving some general background on the tool, but also on the agreement itself. 
Uh, it provides guidance on how to fill the, the inventory tables that we have mentioned at the beginning. And then for each obligation, uh, it does reproduce the, the relevant legal provisions. It includes a summary box uh, to present the obligation in a way that's concise and accessible. It provides uh, some general explanations on what, uh, what each obligation means. Um, but probably most importantly, it provides very detailed explanations on how to answer the particular questions uh, in, the, in the current alignment table and the ongoing alignment table for each obligation. Um, so, so this is really uh, this is really a document that's meant to be a help when uh, when filling the checklist. But the checklist is the core of the of the tool. Um, that concludes that uh, that fairly short overview of the of the um, of the tool. Uh, but uh, but we know that there's quite a lot of information. So I've provided you here with the with the email addresses of the of the team. If you would like to to reach out to us, uh, we would be happy to have further discussions uh, on that tool. Uh, so please do not hesitate to to reach out. Um, and with this, I'll give the floor to to Yeva, who will who will show you the web page on which you can find the tool, and will also open the the documents for you so that you can you can see what they look like. Um, so Yeva, you have the floor, and let's try to make this happen. Thanks a lot, Tristan. And we're just gonna take a second to move this laptop around. And here we are. I hope that all of you hear me well. And uh, let me just first of all start with um, the tool as it is uh, published on the ISD website. You will find it here with a very nice picture on showcasing our the, the tool. And the can you yeah. speak up a bit? Okay. I'll, I'll just I'll just try to move closer and uh, we will uh, therefore uh, have two documents published already below the first one uh, and and the, the principal document that Tristan was talking about is a checklist that you will see here as I'm hovering it's turning light blue and the guide is called publication for one reason or another but it is still the guide uh, that uh, Tristan just talked about and just by clicking on one of these, uh, you will be able to do download one or another as things are happening. Once you click on the checklist, it will download and open the document, uh, which looks like this. It's just a, a top page of a tool. You might or might not choose to, to fill in uh, those, those basic um, contact details, depending really on what you intend to do with the tool. But afterwards, you will see that the ta corresponding tabs in the check checklist are matching the sections in the guide. So that will make uh, the uh, navigation between the checklist and guide easier. You will also see that the short names are more or less corresponding to uh, to the articles of the agreement. And uh, there is the inventory table so that Tristan just showcased in his slides. Just by scrolling down there, you can see all of them. And even going through this first and, and I would say still quite principal tab will, uh, will allow you to get a very good insight of, on what exactly is the information and data that needs to be collected before we even get deeper into the implementation of the agreement. It will also provide a lot of data that you will need later on. Uh, Tristan mentioned the Article 4 implementation tables, and he, uh, they are here. The current alignment tables are a bit uh, more complex than they were at his slides, but they are here, as well as the notification tab. I specifically want to showcase this additional uh, table that doesn't really demand any any type of information to be included by the users, but it can serve as a very useful reminder on what exactly should be notified or informed to our WTO members and when. Uh, I think uh, it's worth noting that um, that I don't, well, I, I, uh, 
I thought that uh, we had the kind of grayed out the areas which don't need users contribution, but uh, I don't see them at least on the screen. Uh, yeah, apparently the, this, the screen is trying to sabotage this presentation, but uh, <laughs> you would normally see it on yours. And let me quick, quickly move to the guide uh, that yeah. I think we're that will download to you as it goes. Um, just by moving to a table of contents, you, you're able to navigate around. So you will have a basic section of introduction and you can move swiftly to the inventory tables, for example. The useful tool for a navigation are also tabs on the site that you can use to quickly jump to other section. And I'll, I'll go to the overfish socks because, well, I like the picture a lot. But also I think that um, it also demonstrates quite well uh, the flow and, and the logic of a guide as, as Tristan was mentioning in his slide. We start with a really quick introduction and sometimes there's not really much to say before we are hopping into this very specific commitment of uh, agreement, like uh, like the basic uh, overfish stocks uh, subsidy prohibition of Article 4. We reproduce very relevant legal text below. We provide some general considerations that need to be thought about before even getting to the, uh, to, to the thinking around the question. And here we will have an explanation of a specific question that, we will, that you will find uh, in the checklist. Sometimes the explanation is quite straightforward. Sometimes it might need uh, a bit more examples or, uh, or just thinking around uh, possible approaches. And you will tr try our, you will find our best attempt at explanation there. And we're pretty sure that there are much more smart uh, people than us who will provide their own afterwards. <laughs> but um, I think this is what what we try to say. Uh, I think what is what is useful is um, a couple of other tabs that you see there that do not match uh, any tables in the checklist. Those are the, for example, provisions. Uh, for LDC members, where we just quickly go, go through agreement and explain what it uh, requires, as well as provisions on technical assistance and capacity building. Uh, those are the things that you will not have tables leading you towards, but you might still find useful to have a look. And yeah, I will stop. I will give the floor back to Alice. That's super. Thank you very much indeed, both of you. And congratulations again, because this has been many months of work and I think the results speak to that. Um, so we're now going to hear from a few people who didn't write the tool, but have seen it um, and have thought about it. Julia, I might give you the, the floor first to give us a sense of how the bank is thinking about the agreement, the tool and your role in implementation of the agreement. Go ahead. Thank you very much, Alice. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Um, let me thank ISD for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. It's my first time in um, at the WTO. Um, I've been working five years at the bank, and it's also a new um, topic that I'm um, taking on <clears throat> as part of uh, my, a new role that I, I took uh, recently at, at the bank. So as we all know, fisheries are a, a vital source of jobs, of income and food security for many, many countries and, and many, many people. Fisheries are a critical driver of long-term economic growth and environmental stability. Today, 37% of the world's population lives in coastal areas, and marine fisheries generate nearly half a trillion dollars in economic impact every year. Aquatic food provides at least 20% of animal protein intake to 3.3 billion people, and all these numbers are coming from FAO. One in 13 people depends directly or indirectly on fisheries and aquaculture for their livelihoods. However, fisheries are under threat. 35.4% of assessed stocks are below sustainable levels. The other threats, the threats impacting fisheries are largely mismanagement, overfishing, habitat degradation, and pollution. And these threats are exacerbated by climate change and IEU fishing. In addition to climate change, two major issues impact productivity and sustainability of global fisheries. Lack of effective management, often but not always driven by quasi open access, nature of most fisheries, which leads to a sustainable level of effort and fishing. The second issue, and this is why we're here, is largely explicit subsidies in the fisheries sector, incentivizing the expansion or, of the fleets or reduce their cost of operation. 
And while these subsidies were intended to support directly food security, employment, they have unintended consequences in driving overfishing. Broad estimates of global subsidies are between 35 and $40 billion a year, of which around above 20 are thought to be harmful. It was therefore a great achievement for the WTO to see in June the successful negotiation of the WTO agreement on fisheries subsidy. And I'd like to congratulate all the members for achieving uh, this successful negotiation. It took some time, as we all know, but it was a very important success for the sustainable conservation and management of fisheries resources around the world. It fully supports the sustainable goal 14 and in particular the target 14.6, but there is still some work that remains to be done to contribute, uh, to address subsidies that contribute to overcapacity and overfishing. Today, as we have moving forward ratification by WTO members and entering to force of the agreement, hopefully sooner, um, as soon as possible, it's necessary to support members, in particular developing countries, in a number of ways. The tool that is being launched today and presented by ISD is the first support to WTO members in implementing the agreement. It supports, as it was just presented, better understanding of the provision of the agreements, identifying the necessary information for the implementation of the agreement, assessing where members stands with regards to the provision and the requirements of the agreement and I think gaps and needs for implementation and complying with the agreements. It's a first tool, it's a fantastic opportunity for countries to take stock and prepare themselves as the agreement is moving forward uh, towards entry into force. It's very important to be ready as soon as possible because we should not waste any time given the figures that were provided before. We're already late. The uh, target 14.6 was supposed to be achieved in 2020. On our side at the World Bank, we stand ready to support our clients, WTO members, in, uh, and in particular developing countries and seeds, to prepare themselves and implement the agreement through the various instruments of the World Bank, whether it is uh, policy operations, whether it is investment projects. The World Bank can and will support the new responsibility and management measures that its clients will be taking under the agreements. We will provide technical and financial support, including through our multi-donor trust fund, ProBlue, for states willing to embrace the reform agenda. Our trust fund is currently around $200 million. It's covering four pillars under the blue economy. One is on fisheries and aquaculture, was in on mine pollution and plastic litter. The third pillar is on oceanic sector, shipping, tourism, offshore marine energy, and integrated seascape management. There is opportunity to use this trust fund to support members in implementing the agreement in using the tool. The three major focus areas that have been identified by the World Bank in support to our clients and namely the first the identification, the assessment, and the measuring of distorting subsidies. Second, to redirect and repurpose harmful subsidies around a sustainable and equitable approach to the sector. And third, supporting sustainable fisheries. To help clients in this effort, the bank has developed a specific approach to a public expenditure review for fisheries that can help identifying, assessing, and measuring distorting subsidies in the fisheries sector. In order to redirect harmful subsidies, the bank is developing a toolkit, for example, on how social protection measures can be used to support fisheries management measures. In extending protection to the fisheries sector, there is an opportunity to align policies or program in a way that they can enable and incentivize sustainable use and management of resources while reducing vulnerability and building resilience to shock and stresses. Government can therefore mobilize domestic resources for social protection and sustainable fisheries by reforming regressive fisheries subsidies and removing harmful fisheries subsidies. In support of sustainable fisheries management, the World Bank can provide the relevant technical assistance and funding, not only because of the technical school and approaches that we can bring to the table, but also because we can finance this transformation through loans, credits, and grants. 
The bank is also supporting the fisheries transparency initiative, FITI, which includes the element of transparency linked to fisheries subsidies and can support countries in fulfilling their obligations towards the agreement. Finally, we're also preparing a chapter on fisheries subsidy as part of a new flagship report that the bank is going to publish very soon on detox development, repurposing environmentally harmful subsidies. Now the World Bank is looking forward to seeing the agreement entering into force, strengthening the partnership with the WTO, its members, as well as the Secretariat, and supporting its client country in implementing and complying with the provision of the agreement. The bank is also looking forward to the second round of negotiation to continue strengthening the agreement and addressing overcapacity and overfishing. And again, thank you very much for your attention and for the invitation. Well, thank you very much indeed, Julien, for coming um, and also for expressing so clearly the intention of the bank to help members in their implementation of this agreement. Um, and I think it's, it was the other interesting thing I think I heard is that this, this work on support for implementation would actually be part of a broader investment the bank makes into sort of the, the blue economy and the different sectors that, that governments may wish to advance. So in that sense, I think that that will help to bring a, a useful coherence in the implementation of this agreement with broader blue economy policies. So that's really helpful. Dominique, I mean, the FAO has followed these negotiations for many years. What are you thinking about what next? Yeah, well, thank you very much, uh, Alex. Uh, Alice, thank you for inviting us. And uh, let me start by congratulating your team for putting together such a tool, uh, such a comprehensive tool. Well, as you know, and as you mentioned, FAO has been uh, following on this negotiation. And once again, FAO would like to fully acknowledge the, the importance of the, of the WTO members achieving uh, an, an agreement on regulating fisheries subsidies. Uh, we, we believe this is a, a true uh, uh, historic achievement that um, at the, that was achieved at the, the 12th ministerial conference. It is clear that this uh, agreement, uh, which regulates many uh, crucial aspects of fisheries uh, that could have detrimental effect on the sustainability of fisheries, uh, is critical on overfished stock, IUU, uh, and areas beyond uh, national jurisdiction without any government oversight. Uh, fisheries is indeed, as you know, a very important commodity in important trade. And you, some of you probably heard my colleague Marcio um, Castro already briefing on that, uh, saying that more than 200 countries export fish and aquaculture products, with 37% of the total production going to overseas market. And the, the figure that I always find, the, the reference that I always find very striking is uh, when we say that uh, compared to other uh, animal proteins, the export value of fisheries and aquaculture products exceeds that of beef, poultry, and pork uh, combined, uh, which is indeed very, very striking. Uh, as you all know, FAO uh, publishes the, the state of world fisheries and aquaculture every two years, the last edition of which was issued at the, on the occasion of the uh, Ocean uh, Conference in Lisbon uh, in June. And uh, indeed, this publication uh, provides an exhaustive analysis of the, the status of uh, global fish stocks, as well as international and regional trend in fisheries and aquaculture. And we, we believe it is an indispensable uh, resource for government, policymakers, and uh, civil society, and all actors in the, in the fisheries and aquaculture uh, industry. Uh, the social an economic aspect of fishing are also, uh, of course, of fundamental importance. Uh, developing nations and small-scale producers play a significant role in production with direct ties to food security and the eradication of poverty. Key elements of the fisheries and aquaculture industry include inclusion patterns involving small-scale production, uh, developing countries, and the gender dimension. Uh, it's also an opportunity today to remind everyone that uh, this year is the International Year of uh, Artisanal Fisheries and Aquaculture. Uh, this, um, I mean, of course, uh, I like the significance of small-scale producers uh, and the need to, to do more to, to support them. Uh, when it comes to the SOFIA report, I would like perhaps to, to highlight uh, one or two uh, figures that are coming out of the report. Uh, and Julien already uh, 
uh, refer to the other part of the, the figure I'm going re to refer to, which is uh, basically the uh, the fact that in 2019, uh, sustainable stocks uh, decreased by 1.2% to account for about 64.6%. He referred to 35. Uh, Four, I think, uh, of world stocks. Uh, non, and this is the bad news. Nonetheless, the, the good news is that 82.5% of total catches came from sustainable stocks, which is a remarkable 3.8% rise uh, compared to before, which basically demonstrate that uh, successful, uh, that these stocks are better managed and that uh, successful fisheries management benefits society operators and uh, and the, the, the entire economy actually uh, moreover moreover these uh, statistics remind us that fisheries and aquaculture development must content, constantly take into consideration the environmental economic and social angles uh, it is clear that government have a variety of measures available uh, to solve uh, environmental fisheries issues and that there is actually no uh, one single agreement or instrument that will suffice to to, accom to accomplish uh, this objective and in that respect the WTO agreement is an essential addition with a different approach to the the, the existing set of uh, of tools guidelines uh, agreement that already exist but in the meantime uh, what we want to highlight is that context matters uh, for countries, there is no blueprint, there is no universal solution to address the issue, and each country must therefore develop its own plan for the sustainable harvesting of its aquatic resource and choose the mo most suitable uh, fisheries management policies based on local factors, historical, uh, political, economic and social context. And in that respect, there are, of course, numerous FAO instruments that exist uh, to support that. Um, the, the, there are also a number of best practice and several uh, excellent examples of how countries have moved from poorly managed and low profitable uh, approaches to uh, and using subsidies to a new stage of healthy uh, stocks and uh, successful uh, fisheries. Uh, FAO, of course, will continue to work closely with WTO and its member to support the continuation of the negotiation. We participated in the retreat uh, three weeks ago, and we will we are committed to continue to, to support uh, in this effort. And in that context, uh, like other speakers, uh, FAO wish to re reiterate its call uh, that member accept the, the recent WTO agreement on fisheries subsidies uh, so that the new disciplines uh, can enter into force as soon as possible. And in this regard, I want to flag that the, the recent uh, FAO uh, committee on fisheries uh, that met uh, uh, highlighted the issue and FAO members were called, and I quote, to accept the agreement and complete further negotiation to achieve a comprehensive agreement on fisheries subsidies. So this is the, the Committee on Fisheries being one of the technical govern, governing body of FAO and its 194 uh, members. Uh, the, in the meantime, it's clear that the phase of implementing uh, any agreement is, is complex and often the implementation is even more complex than the negotiation itself, which shouldn't mean we should desperate because it has been long for negotiating this agreement. I, I hope implementation will be faster, but still. Uh, the, the, the WTO agreement on fisheries is indeed a multilateral agreement dealing with resource management issues, which means that there will be a multitude of actors at national level that will need to be uh, involved, not only uh, those authorities in charge of fisheries, but also in charge of trade, environment, and, uh, and many uh, government departments, which makes it, uh, um, which makes that the diversity of actors can create indeed uh, additional uh, challenges for the implementation. Uh, as you all know, of course, FAO and WTO will collaborate in order to provide necessary assistance to countries during the implementation phase. And uh, the type of support that can pro be provided by FAO goes from uh, information collection analysis, uh, reporting, uh, development of management plans, etc. That can be accessed by members 
We have in FAO something called the Technical Cooperation Program, which is a demand-driven process by which members can request FAO support and, and resources in a, in a given uh, arrangement. Uh, however, uh, it is very clear that uh, additional practical and easy to use tools, such as the one uh, that has been presented today, uh, will be uh, incredibly beneficial for complex issues, such as the implementation phase of the agreement. Um, identifying national shortcomings in the fish areas present in the WTO agreement on fishery subsidies can be facilitated by the use of, uh, of such tool. And um, I would say, in concluding that, um, furthermore, from our perspective, this is this early and easy identification of potential weaknesses can significantly help uh, the dialogue between national government, the WTO, and FAO in defining the necessary technical support that will need to be uh, provided uh, to ensure successful uh, in uh, implementation. Now, again, uh, let me uh, congratulate ISD on behalf of FAO for the for such uh, an, an achievement. And uh, it's clear that uh, this will be a, a very valuable uh, instrument that will contribute to the implementation. Thank you very much. Super, Dominique. Uh, thank you very much indeed. And thank you to the FAO for their tireless support to this to these efforts. Um, I'm going to highlight here the fact that you've said how important context is and context matters. And this was something just to note that was very present in all of the development of this toolkit. So as you read through the questions and as you read through the guide, you'll see that we have been very careful never to prescribe exactly what a country needs to do because that will depend very much on your fisheries, the organization of your domestic administrations, whether you provide subsidies at all, etc. So we have tried to be helpful without being prescriptive. Um, and I should say that we also benefited greatly in the development of the tool uh, from the input from the Marine Resources Assessment Group, MRAG, based in London, who are fisheries management experts, uh, and from Gustav Brink from Trade Remedies Limited. Uh, and Gustav works regularly with developing countries in their trade remedies work. So speaking of context, um, Mr. Dabi, you have been extremely patient. We would be very interested in hearing your perspective uh, from Mauritius about this tool and the implementation of this agreement. The floor is yours, sir. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Debbie from Mauritius, uh, working at the Ministry of Blue Economy, and uh, I've been involved in the whole process of fisheries subsidies negotiation all throughout. So I, from my perspective, I will just uh, be giving some remarks and observations about the tool and uh, some suggestions that could be helpful in guiding the LDCs and developing countries. So I would like to highlight that the whole basis of uh, all these fisheries subsidies agreement is based on protection of biodiversity loss, and ensuring sustainability of our marine resources, which have, which have normally been caused by overexploitation or mismanagement of our resources. It has been proved that fisheries subsidies as such have been contributing to overcapacity, overfishing, and promoting IUU fishing. In fact, they have diverted their original role from uh, supporting fisheries in terms of job creation and uh, food security, and they have been diverted to overcapacity, overfishing, and uh, promoting IUU fishing. So this is where we emanate at the SDG 14.6, which we are today discussing and we are trying to implement. Uh, WTO finally came up with, it's not WTO, but uh, after two decades of <laughs> uh, tiredness, so two decades of discussion on this uh, WTO negotiation on fisheries subsidies, WTO finally came with the fisheries subsidies agreement in June, July, 2022. But it is worth noting that this uh, new FSA, has come up with a set of new obligations that are new and complex to most of the WTO members. 
it was just like a shift in paradigm with new obligations with tons of information requirement from member states. Then uh, here I will thank uh, the IS, IISD for promoting, for creating, and eh? creating a useful tool, what we call the self-assessment tool that will definitely help all the member states. In, in fact, I, I, IISD have tried as far as possible to attend to all the obligations in a simplified language for better understanding by member states using self-assessment checklist and the guide, the guide which is quite simple step-by-step -step explanation on how to attend to those obligations. And uh, the self-assessment tool is also very useful. Eh? I have gone through the text of all of these tables and the guidelines. It is found to be very useful and helpful in self-assessment of the existing and future uh, compliance to the, to the obligations. In fact, it will help us to assess the type of actions that the WTO members will need to take at the domestic level to implement the agreement. For example, establishing mechanisms for information gathering and notification, establishing coordination mechanisms between the agencies, establishing rules and procedures to ensure that no prohibited subsidies are provided, it will also help members to determine the present status of the country in terms of compliance to the obligations. It will also help members to understand the course of actions to be taken to comply with and to remain compliant in the future with all those obligations. It will help in the determination of shortcomings and how to address them will help to determine the legal requirements, provisions, and rules that should be domesticated to remain compliant. It can also help members to identify their needs. But the needs that I, I, I would like to emphasize here, the targeted assistance needs, because a country cannot uh, just say, come and say, I don't know anything. They have to be specific so that uh, the supporting agency can help at right at the beginning of the process. And it would be easier for them to help them. And then uh, as a general reflection from my side would be, although I, IISD has simplified the understanding of the obligations, there are still some members, specifically, I'm specifically talking about the LDCs and SVs, who are subject to obligations that are maybe alien to them for the first time because they have been practicing coastal type of fishery, artisanal type of fisheries most of their time till today itself. So still, I would humbly request, make a suggestion that they be given some more time and provided with training for capacity building on how to use the checklist for the first time to give them a thorough understanding of the legal obligations and to help them in mitigating any shortcomings. I would also suggest that additional time be granted for the notification of the WTO because since it came into operation, the agreement, I think nobody has have started this notification process so far. So it would be best if we can extend some time, especially to those LDCs and developing countries. And also I would like to suggest that an online electronic platform be set up to help the members with regard to queries on the new set of fisheries subsidies agreements. And then if need be, we can, I would also recommend that experts be dispatched to those countries to help them 
in, in the visit for Moji. And finally, I would strongly make a plea to all the WTO members, at least to try and attempt to fill in the new, to comply with the new fisheries subsidies agreement obligations at will, as it will definitely contribute towards the sustainability of marine resources for our future generations by ensuring food security, helping the coastal member states to gain the livelihood and to combat IUU fishing. That is a, a, an evil in today's era that is causing much harm to our fisheries resources. Thank you. And I would like to thank IISD for giving me this opportunity to voice out a, our part of, a, as a representative of SIDS and the LDCs to voice out our plea, our queries to ISSD and to WTO for them to, to attempt at least to understand our situations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Mr. Dabi. And I think your, your messages and your voice have reached us here in Geneva, although it feels like a long way away. Um, and I think you know, there, there was one of your requests that I think I can respond to immediately, which is, is there some support available for using the toolkit and working through it? Um, and I can say immediately yes, because that is what IISD would like to do with members who would like some support working through the toolkit, understanding the questions, uh, support contacting other departments to, to work through the toolkit together. That's exactly what we are available to do. Um, in terms of timeframes, of course, none of the obligations come into force until the agreement comes into force. Uh, and members will be working through acceptance and ratification before then. So thank you for that perspective. I think it was extremely useful. Um, and I'm going to give the floor, last but absolutely not least, uh, to you, Frank. How are you thinking and how is Germany thinking about the implementation of this deal next? Positively, always positively. Yeah. Um, thank you, Alice, for the invitation and uh, good afternoon to, to everybody in the room and, and the offices uh, at home. Um, you, you will know Germany has a strong interest in a functioning and updating WTO. That means we want this organization to work efficiently in traditional fields and to be able to discover new fields as far as they are necessary and related to trade. And as a second thing I would really emphasize that IISD is a, a very trustworthy, competent and reliable partner that we can strongly recommend to work with. And this is not just for the lunch. <laughs> this, is, ask him to say this, by the way. this is as well, because when somebody offers you something, I say, yeah, I have a checklist that will make you happy. But I think uh, the first question you should ask is who, who, who's approaching me? Who gives me that? And if you know about the person and if you know what their mindset is and how they think, how they work, if you have good experience, and we do have, then I think it's a fair chance to look at the document and to make your decision whether this is useful for you or not. And we think the longer you will look at it, the more you will like it. Okay, MC12, I have to say for Germany, this was a successful conference. I have colleagues uh, that enjoyed other conferences. They enjoyed this one and they said this was a good one. And we think it was a good one, yes, because we achieved on, uh, we have an achievement on the fishery subsidies. Uh, so that is really uh, a serious item uh, on, the, on the agenda that we, uh, where we got something. And by the way, it's uh, even a part of the Doha mandate. Uh, so a long time ago, but we can make a little click there at least. Um, 20 years of negotiations, of course, it means different periods, active and less active. But in June, we had a very active phase that came to an end. Now we learned, we, we call it the first wave. But honestly, we, we hope that the second wave uh, will come to an end and to some results a bit uh, sooner. And 
when we look at what we have achieved, the result is okay, is not uh, overwhelming, is not absolutely fantastic, but we think it is something we can work with. And you can work with what you prove with your document. And members of the WTO, they can make that treaty meaningful. If they have ambitions and if they show their ambitions. So that is in your hands to all members. I need to say that. What we have in the text is a strong commitment against IEU fishing, is a strong statement for more sustainability, is good progress or transparency, and we will have more institutional debates on this issue. This is promised by the agreement. Uh, and I think there is some need, because if uh, you ask my fisheries experts in my country, they will say, well, it, it's a great success. We, we know and we accept. But um, so far, we have little on overcapacities and state aid that lead to overcapacities is a problem. So let's let's see where we will go the next uh, months and years. One thing uh, I guess is out of question, and everybody will agree that uh, we learned that trade is related, is related to environmental issues, is not standing aside. So we at WTO have a reason to look at this. And we have a growing mindset uh, amongst this. What we now need, well, what, what do we need? We need uh, progress on ratifications. And then we need implementation in good faith and with your own best will. And when it comes to the ratifications, as for what I hear, in Brussels, people are very busy. So we will have our political institutions to discuss the issue this year, very soon. And then I'm hopeful for a decision, a final legally binding decision for next year. Let's see. Uh, what I can promise, it will be a lean process uh, because uh, my parliament in Berlin will not be asked. It's not necessary. So when you get a yes from Brussels and Strasbourg, you will get a yes for 27. So and I hope for that, uh, for that strong statement and uh, that it may be a good signal. And for everybody else, well, uh, what what we need for ratification okay it's a some formal things uh I, I learned from the secretariat we need to identify the protocol express the consent to be bound the signature the name the title of the person who's doing it if you need the details the secretariat is ready to tell you all and i think well well they left but they were in the room and they are in the building <laughs> and they are available for everybody who has some doubt what is to do exactly on this issue. What everybody has to do in general in the face of ratification is to rethink, well, I have an international document. What does it mean for me? What does it mean for my national order? Because ratification from the internal side means you bring a new legal document into your home legislation. So that is a very serious process. And I hope that this tool can be a help. Um, and here it comes into play. It is, I think, a, a rather easygoing approach, user-friendly, at least uh, as long as you look into the first part of it. So mm. the checklist is something I think you can you get a good overview in, in a couple of minutes. Um, yeah. I would just be very happy if uh, everybody considers it, if everybody looks. And if you decide not to work with that, well, then work with something else, mm -hmm. what is more, more useful for you. But I think it is really uh, a good approach and you spend your time uh, wisely when you see the result. Mm -hmm. What shall it tell us? It shall tell you, it shall tell us. Uh, yeah, the understanding, a first understanding of the new rules, a first self-assessment, a possible identification of needs for assistance, if needed. What uh, brings me to, uh, I think, an interesting point for many, technical assistance capacity building. I think there were many proposals and suggestions in over 20 years in the fisheries negotiations, and a lot of doubts 
and a lot of uh, disagreements on specific things. But I never heard anyone questioning technical assistance. So we seem to agree if there is this need, and if there can be done something to help someone out, well, this makes this treaty stronger, this brings life into the treaty. So it's good, it's good for the treaty, for, for organization and the motives of the treaty, of course. But technical assistance and capacity building, well, technical assistance, I like to underline, it's assistance. And assistance means, from uh, the perspective of uh, development cooperation, assistance means that the one who gives is the passenger. And the one who takes needs to be the driver. Of course, sometimes you're doing the job together, but you should not think that a so-called donor country has the tooth and knows what is to do. This approach doesn't work. It's not sustainable if you want like that. So here again with this tool, maybe this is an approach to identify, okay, where am I? Where are things for me to improve? And where are things where I expect help? What concepts do I follow? Which policies do I have? What is my administration doing? In which uh, form are they? Well, which, uh, which resources do I have? Because uh, whenever you start a project and if it shall be successful, we need ownership by the country where the action takes place. And this country needs to show responsibility. And if that happens, then we have a chance that once the project is finished, we still will be half success. So that's why I really like to underline assistance. And that might bring me to your last point. Uh, yeah, ministers have agreed on a funding mechanism and secretariat worked out a concept for a fisheries uh, fund. Uh, I expect a notification soon. So at least that will be on the table. And um, we are supportive to the idea of a funding mechanism. And we see that positive as a positive uh, option as well. Because the purpose should be to strengthen impl implementation and to further work on the development of more sustainable policies mm -hmm. in a practical, technical way. So if you need help to find the right project, if you need help to define what, what should the assistance be, maybe again back to the tool, maybe in the whole long, long list of questions, you will find one or two questions that will lead you to the answer. Um, what actually do I want to do in the field of technical assistance? why can a funding mechanism be useful? Because it's, if it is only one element that is needed. No? So I try to finish with a nice sentence, colleagues, friends in the room and at home, we need common solutions for common problems. And uh, the EU, Germany, other member states of the EU and many other WTO members are willing and uh, are do working on this and in that direction in the interest of all. Thank you. Thank you, Raminda. Thank you very much, Frank. That was a good line, but it wasn't your best. I thought the best line was the one about the one who gives is the passenger in this process and the one who receives is the driver. Um, and I wrote that down and I'm going to repeat it again and probably steal it because that was essentially... That was really the philosophy behind this toolkit. It's a self-assessment tool for kit for governments to work out for themselves where they are and if they need help, exactly what they need help for so that they can take the results of the toolkit and take it to donors and agencies, 
and the WTO Secretariat perhaps and say, here is what I believe I need. And again, if you need help working through the toolkit, we can do that for you. Please feel free to use this toolkit. Um, ask us for help if you would like it. Uh, we hope that it's useful to you. Um, and we look forward to supporting you both in the use of the toolkit and the implementation of the agreement that you have, uh, and also the negotiations uh, going forward. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you to those of you online uh, and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you very much.